Skillshare is for designers, photographers, marketers, artists, and lifelong learners. Skillshare is for foodies, commuters, risk takers, the young, and the young at heart. It's for strategists, free spirits, purists, the bold, the curious, the characters, the makers, and the breakers. Skillshare is for everyone, an online learning community with thousands of classes to advance your career, improve the world, and pursue the work you love. What will you learn next? It all starts on Skillshare. We've seen a couple of examples of how punctuation matters. Um, in this lecture, we're going to take a look at the comma, which is a very useful little punctuation device. And it seems to be modest and seems to um, not, not matter that much. Uh, we could just willy-nilly sprinkle uh, commas around our sentences, but that's not true. Um, and uh, there's a story uh, from uh, a play by Christopher Marlowe, who's a contemporary of Shakespeare, accounted to be a great playwright in his own right. Um, and in it, uh, in this play, uh, he's uh, writing about the English Civil Wars, the Civil Wars that racked England uh, back in the day, uh, back in the medieval era. And um, a general who was fighting for the rebel leader, the, uh, you know, the leader who wanted to be king, uh, captured the actual king, and he didn't know what to do, you know, or he knew what he could do, but he didn't want the responsibility on his own hands. What should he do? Should he take the king prisoner? Should he put him in jail? Uh, should he imprison him? Should he kill him? Um, this was a weighty, very important decision, and he wanted someone higher above him to make that decision. So he sent a message off to his leader and waited anxiously for instructions to come back. And so with that cliffhanger, we'll move on to the next slide. We'll find out what happened. So after a long day of waiting, the message came, and it was in writing, so that was good. He would have unambiguous proof that he had been merely following orders, and he opened it up. Uh, he opened up the, uh, the message, the missive, with trembling hands, and there he saw the message. And he probably said a few bad words um, in medieval English um, uh, because the message wasn't so un unambiguous, you see, because it said, fear not to kill the king. But what does that mean? It is missing commas, all important commas, that would change the meaning of the phrase, depending on how you looked at it. Did it mean fear not to kill the king? That is, don't be afraid to kill the king. Or did it mean fear not to kill the king? That is, you had better be afraid. You had better not kill the king. Well, he knew what he was being ordered to do. But he knew that no matter what he did, he would be held to account and he would be held responsible. And all because of a comma that was or was not there. Now, I hope your life never hangs on such a slender thread as a comma. Uh, but as we can see, uh, commas do matter. Commas change meaning. And uh, in the last lecture, I talked about the, uh, you know, the phrase, woman without her man is nothing. What is that? Is that woman without her man is nothing? Or is it woman without her man is nothing? You see, so it changes meaning. And we have a couple of real life examples over here. I'm pointing in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, uh, this actually appeared on a magazine cover. Um, Rachel Ray finds inspiration in cooking her family and her dog. Hmm. <laughs> I don't want to go over to her house for dinner. Okay. And then this real life sign that actually appeared. Hunters, please use caution when hunting pedestrians using walk trails. Okay. I'm not going to take a walk there. Okay. So punctuation matters and comma matters. Commas matter. So uh, that's the lesson that we're going to take with us as we go into this lesson. We're going to find out when we should use commas and how we can use them so our meaning is unambiguous. 
Now, why do we need rules for commas? Back in the third grade, Mrs. Grundy told me, put a comma wherever you pause. So that's the rule that I followed for a long time. But that doesn't quite work, and we'll find out why. Why doesn't that rule work? Well, I'll give you an example from my own life. Now, you may have noticed, <laughs> you may have noticed I'm not the smoothest of speakers. Well, when I was a kid, I had a terrible stutter. Uh, much worse than uh, than I have now. Um, and so when my teacher told me, when Mrs. Grundy told me, I put a comma wherever I paused, I did. And so my writing ended up looking like this down here. Okay. Uh, for my summer vacation, I w w went to some place for, uh, and I w w went to some mer camp. Okay, so I was putting a comma where I paused in the middle of words. Okay, so that rule doesn't quite work. And what about the person who never pauses at all? They just keep on talking without a break or a pause a lacuna like an oncoming freight train. <laughs> they wouldn't use a comma. They might not even use spaces. So, again, that rule doesn't quite work, does it, to put a comma wherever you pause? You see, if we follow the put a comma wherever you pause rule, there's no way to evaluate whether a comma is correctly placed in the sentence or not. Uh, there's no way for a reader to evaluate, and there's no way for a teacher to evaluate. You know, all the writer has to say is, well, I paused there. I took a breath there. So, <laughs> nah, 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 nah. you can't get me, right? <laughs> the comma is correctly placed because I took a breath there. Um, but that doesn't make sense. In fact, that way madness lies. Um, there are definitive rules for comma placement. I think of the comma as a traffic sign for the sentence. It tells us where to go, where to pause. It, it groups words into meaning groups, groups of meaning, logical groups. And uh, in the slides that follow, we're going to encounter the definitive comma rules. The first comma rule that we'll encounter is you use a comma when you're joining independent clauses joined by a coordinating conjunction, such as the boy hit the ball and he ran to first base. The ball went deep into left field, but he was thrown out at first. Okay, so there we have two independent clauses. Remember, an independent clause is a clause that could stand as a sentence by itself. And they're joined by a coordinating conjunction, which is one of the fanboys. So here, now we're starting to link everything that we've uh, learned together. Okay, so that's number one rule uh, when you're joining independent clauses with a coordinating conjunction. Just a couple more examples of uh, this first rule, the joining of uh, two independent clauses using one of the fanboys, for, and, nor, but, or, yet, or so. Um, the boys wanted to stay up till midnight but they grew tired and fell asleep. I thought I had the biggest bag of candy, yet Opal proved me wrong. Okay, so here we see a couple of the comma uses, uh, well, the one instance of the comma use in a couple of different examples. The second rule is that we use a comma to set off, or set off, a, um, an introductory element that is a word, a phrase, or a clause that uh, precedes the main part of the sentence, that precedes the, the independent clause. That's the uh, main part of the sentence. Um, and we have a couple of examples um, over here. Um, however, it was still cold. You see that however uh, sets off the main part of the sentence, the independent clause, it was still cold. A phrase uh, can be seen in the next example. In the fall, comma, we enjoy watching football. So that in the fall is set off with a comma. Okay, so uh, that's another example. And the uh, third example, when the rain stopped. You see, so that's a clause. That's a dependent clause. That's a subordinate clause. And when it begins the sentence, we set it off with a comma uh, before we launch into the, uh, the main clause, the independent clause. When the rain stopped, we went outside. Now, it's true that sometimes you can hear where we pause there, and very often we do. Um, but the rule, again, is not to put a comma wherever you pause. It's uh, that the pause happens to follow the comma. You see, so that, that's how that works. Okay, so to set off introductory elements, um, you use a comma. I have a couple other examples over here. 
uh, just to illustrate the point of using the comma to set off the uh, introductory element. And one is, after the rain started coming down, the umpire called the ball game. Or, another example, because it was such a miserable day, we decided against going to the beach. Okay, so um, those are a couple examples of whole clauses, whole dependent clauses, whole subordinate clauses uh, preceding the independent clause. The next comma rule has to do with unnecessary elements within a sentence. This refers to elements that are grammatically unnecessary and sometimes even um, in terms of the central meaning of the sentence, unnecessary. And so we have a couple of examples over here, such as Susan, however, prefers going to the mall. So this might be within the context of my saying something like, I um, like to go to the beach. Susan, however, likes to go to the mall. So that, however, is a link to a previous sentence. Uh, but in terms of the grammar and the structure of the sentence, it is unnecessary, though it provides important information in a sense. Um, another example is, um, again, over here, Mr. Pringle, who is soon to leave the company to start his own business, suggested we undertake the new venture. So that whole clause that's set off in blue, that's uh, highlighted in blue, who is soon to leave the company, to start his own business. That's unnecessary. It's unnecessary for the, the overall structure of the sentence. It's additional information. It's nice to know, but it's not necessary. And then lastly, my uncle Fred, who lives in Florida, is a mailman. So that living in Florida is unnecessary information, is accounted to be unnecessary information. And it's not necessary to identify which uncle it is that you're talking about because well, it's Uncle Fred, and you know him. Anyway, okay, so we use the commas to set off unnecessary elements, and these are used, these commas here are used in a parenthetical manner. So, and if you remember our uh, discussion about the parentheses, the parentheses is always uh, used in pairs, so, you know, you have this encapsulating device, and if this element comes within the middle of the sentence, uh, these commas, too, are used in pairs. You always see these in pairs. These, these kinds of parenthetical um, commas always come in pairs, unless, of course, they're at either the beginning of the sentence or the end. Over here, we'll see a couple uh, sentences that give us an idea of a necessary element versus an unnecessary element. And remember, it's the unnecessary element that's set off by commas. And so, as in the previous um, uh, uh, slide, we, um, we use the uh, example sentence, my uncle Fred, who lives in Florida, is a mailman. So, who lives in Florida would be unnecessary uh, and unnecessary to identify who it is that you're talking about. You're talking about Uncle Fred. So we've already identified the person. But if you say something like, my uncle who lives in Florida is a mailman, you see, then that whole phrase is necessary to identify who it is that you're talking about. I mean, you're not talking about Uncle Bill, Uncle Ron, Uncle Gene, uh, Uncle Patsy. <laughs> uh, you're talking about the uncle who lives in Florida. Okay, so then that then that who lives in Florida moves from being an unnecessary element to being a necessary element, and necessary in the sense that it identifies which uncle you're talking about. So this is an important distinction. And uh, so the commas will set off the unnecessary elements, but sometimes that element that can be identical to an unnecessary element becomes necessary. And so you don't use commas to set it off. So uh, so just remember the example, my uncle who lives in Florida is a mailman, and then my uncle who lives in Florida is one identifier, okay, uh, versus my uncle Fred, comma, who lives in Florida, comma, is a mailman, in which case that clause, who lives in Florida, that relative clause, who lives in Florida, is not necessary, and so it's set off by commas. The next rule that we'll take a look at will be the use of commas in a series of words. Um, could be words, phrases, clauses. Um, 
And uh, this follows the, peer, uh, the pattern of A, comma, B, comma, C, comma, and D. And I'll talk about a little variation uh, on this in the next slide. But for right now, we'll just take a look at that pattern. So apples, comma, oranges, comma, cherries, and pears. And so, and so we see the example over here. And the commas I have highlighted in red. So, you know, calls your attention to it. And so you see the comma comes after each item in the series. Um, another example would be uh, Tom, Fred, Mary, and Joe went to the party together. Okay, so, and each name is followed by a comma. It sets off items in a series. Um, and sometimes you have uh, more complicated arrangements, such as we brought beer and pizza, comma, macaroni and cheese, comma, and ice cream and cake. Okay, so, uh, that's a weird <laughs> potluck type of party, but nevertheless, that's what we all brought. Okay, so, um, and the last one, takes a look at the uses of actual uh, clauses set off with commas. So the quarterback threw for 300 yards, the crowd cheered wildly, and our home team won the championship. And so uh, we have a comma after each one of those clauses. Quarterback threw for 300 yards, comma, the crowd cheered wildly, comma, and our home team won the championship. Yay! Okay. So, but each one of those clauses, uh, in this last sentence is set off by commas as well. It just follows the, you know, the rule uh, uh, following the pattern of uh, A comma, B comma, C comma, and D. Okay, so that's the rule. Use commas uh, to set off items in a series. The rule that I have just enunciated, the, um, uh, the commas in a series up to the, uh, the last item before the and, is a rule that's in dispute and not everybody agrees with it. Um, some style books uh, uh, will not have you use the comma before the and. Okay, so they would say A comma B comma C and D. Okay, versus the method that I suggested A comma B comma C comma and D. Um, there's a reason that I suggest it, because I think it clarifies and it reduces ambiguity. So we can see over here uh, the funny little you know, illustration that I borrowed from uh, the Internet um, uh, using what's called the Oxford comma. That is the comma before the and. Okay, so, uh, so we invited the strippers, JFK and Stalin. Okay, so we invited the strippers, comma, JFK, comma, and Stalin. So that becomes very clear that as the drawing shows, we invited four people, uh, JFK, Stalin, and um, two strippers. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> what a fun party. Okay, um, but without the Oxford comma, it becomes a little ambiguous, and it's very possible to interpret uh, the sentence, we invited the strippers, comma, JFK and Stalin. So JFK and Stalin becomes a modifier, what's called an appositive to strippers. And so we invited the strippers who were JFK and Stalin. So the two strippers were JFK, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the uh, American president, uh, John F. Kennedy, and Joseph Stalin, the, uh, the Soviet uh, tyrant. Okay, those are the two strippers. Uh, I guess in the afterlife they've uh, taken on other occupations. And so that comma, that Oxford comma, helps clarify all the items are in a series versus um, doing something else, versus modifying what's come before. So uh, I would suggest using the Oxford comma uh, versus um, uh, confusing uh, your uh, invitation list to the party. Now, along the same idea, uh, using commas to set off items in a series, you also do this with adjectives, adjectives that are modifying the same noun. Um, so, uh, so, for instance, it was a dark, stormy night. Okay, so dark, comma, stormy night. And so you don't use a comma uh, after the last adjective before the noun. Okay, so you notice there's a comma between dark and stormy. Um, the the rule that you can follow here, or a guide that you can follow, is if you could also use an and 
in the place of the comma. So you would say it was a dark and stormy night, you see. So, so then if you don't want to use the and, the comma would be uh, appropriate. You could say the night was dark and stormy. He was a tall bearded man is another example that we have over here. Uh, he was tall, comma, bearded. Because you could also say he was tall and bearded. You see, uh, uh, he was a tall and bearded man. The man was tall and bearded. Okay, so, so if you can use an and in place of the comma uh, in a list of adjectives, then you would uh, use the comma. Okay, uh, if you don't want to be using the and. And, and, and. and of course, if you have a long list of adjectives, um, the commas would probably be better. The, the dog was uh, fierce, big, growling, uh, rabid, and hairy. Okay, you see, so you'd use a comma after each one of those rather than an and in between uh, each one of the adjectives. Okay, so uh, so the rule for a series uh, for comma usage holds true uh, for adjectives as well as nouns. The one exception to the above rule is if you are using what's called a phrasal noun. That is a a noun that is a single idea but it's expressed using two words, such as, uh, as I show in the uh, example here, white rhino. So a white rhino is a single kind of animal. It's not a rhinoceros that happens to be white. It's a white rhino. Um, and so if I wrote a sentence, something along the lines of, it was an endangered white rhino, you notice I would not use a comma because I couldn't say the rhino was endangered and white. You see, because it's a white rhino. The white rhino was endangered, you see. So I wouldn't use a comma in this instance. And likewise, uh, if I said the rare red wine was delicious, again, I wouldn't use a comma because it's not a wine that was rare and red. It uh, was a red wine that was rare. So again, I wouldn't use a comma because the phrasal noun, red wine, is a single idea. Okay, it, it's in effect, it's one word, even though it looks like it's two words. So just remember that if you have a, a phrasal noun, the, the, what appears to be the adjective uh, is not included in your series of adjectives. Okay, so the phrasal noun works as a single word by itself. Another rule has to do with the usage of commas with quotes. And so you use a comma to segue into or leave a direct quote. And so we have the example here. Tom said, quote, it sure is hot. And, quote, it sure is, unquote, Mary replied. And so you see that each one of those, we go into the quote, Tom said, comma, and then the quote marks, and then the, uh, and, and then what Tom said, um, and uh, in the response, um, we have the quote, it sure is, comma, close quotes, Mary replied. And so uh, we use the comma to enter into and leave uh, direct quotes. But not if you have other punctuation. So uh, again, you know, the whole Mary, Tom dialogue here. Um, scintillating and fascinating, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, you want some ice water? He asked. So notice that we have the question mark because he's asking a uh, question, but there's no comma. It's not, you want some ice water, question mark, comma, or comma, question mark. You don't double up on the punctuation. If there's another uh, item of punctuation uh, used inside the quotes, uh, you don't use the uh, comma as well. And this is a general rule. You don't double up on, on, on punctuation. Um, and so, you know, Mary responds, quote, sure, I'm dying of heat stroke, exclamation point, close quotes. But you don't have a comma there. And so, so the exclamation point, in a sense, overrules the comma. Uh, and so it's not, quote, sure, I'm dying of heat stroke, exclamation point, comma, close quotes. Okay, so you don't double up on the, uh, on, on the punctuation. Uh, in or out of uh, quotes, uh, but you uh, do use the comma if you don't have other punctuation. You use a comma also when you're addressing somebody
directly. And of course, we don't um, uh, use commas in speech, and that's very often where we are speaking directly to somebody. But when you record that 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 speech, that utterance, um, uh, you would use a comma to uh, uh, to record it. Um, so you would say, Tom, comma, come in here and do your homework. So that Tom, the name Tom, you're talking to Tom, is set off with a comma. And if the name of the person that you're talking to, that you're addressing, is in the middle of the sentence, again, you'd set it off on both sides as a parenthetical, um, uh, such as, I told you many times, comma, Sally, comma, I told you many times, Sally, that references in the work cited are alphabetized by the last name of the author. And so you see Sally is set off on both sides with a comma. So if you're addressing somebody directly, you would use a comma uh, to set off their name. So here we get to the seventh and last rule for commas. And so we're almost done. So just hang in there. Um, this you might think of as the miscellaneous category. So you use commas in uh, dates, places, and numbers. And so dates, such as the example that I have, uh, where is it? It's, uh, it's over here. Um, he was born on July 4th, 1900, in a thunderstorm. So uh, he was born on July 4th, comma, 1900, comma. Okay, so also notice uh, sometimes um, uh, we miss the comma uh, after the year. Okay, after the year, we missed the comma, uh, but you have to have the comma there as well. Um, so July 4th, comma, 1900, comma. Okay, um, we traveled to Akron, comma, Ohio on our vacation. We traveled to Akron, Ohio on our vacation. So the Ohio is set off on both sides as a comma. If you want to, uh, you can think of the Ohio or, you know, the 1900 in this case um, as parenthetical elements. They further define, further uh, specify what July 4th or or what Akron and what state it is that we're talking about is so if that helps you. Um, so dates and places and also numbers and you should be pretty familiar with this. Uh, we set it off, uh, uh, we use a comma to set off uh, each thousand. So four thousand five hundred dollars would be four comma Five hundred uh, five zero zero. The new car from India only costs four thousand five hundred dollars off the showroom floor. So it's a new import from India. Um, they're able to um, employ less expensive labor and uh, perhaps um, produce a smaller car, and so it only costs forty five hundred dollars. Okay, um, more than sixty five thousand fans attended the game. So notice we have sixty five to represent the thousands, and then the comma, and then the three zeros, okay? Uh, American Idol has been, uh, has been viewed by more than 30 million viewers. So 30, comma, zero, 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 comma, and then zero, zero, zero. Okay, so we use commas to, uh, to uh, divide numbers into groups of thousands as well. So these are the miscellaneous uses of the comma. So. We've come to the end of the uh, discussion about commas, and you never thought that commas, those little, tiny little marks, could be so complicated. Well, they are. Uh, now, remember, commas save lives, as, uh, as we saw. Let's eat grandpa. Okay, so I hope you use a comma there. You aren't suggesting that we actually eat grandpa. And, uh, and to leave you, um, uh, we'll take a look at the example above that actually appeared on somebody's resume. And so my hobbies include cooking dogs, shopping, dancing, watching movies, and belly dancing. So, so the cooking dogs is a little bit problematic, um, but uh, we're also left confused as to whether this person likes to watch movies and watch belly dancing, or w whether it's watching movies and perhaps doing belly dancing. Okay, so anyway, um, don't leave your reader confused. Use commas correctly, and um, you'll find them very useful, very helpful in your communication.